All right, thanks very much. Uh, firstly, I'll start with a confession. I don't actually wear glasses, but given that I'm standing in front of this rather kind of beautiful <laughs> backdrop here, I thought that I would wear glasses today to make me look more academic. <laughs> so it's more a statement of intent than a functional requirement. The other thing I should just start off with saying is that I do have a slightly personal motivation for being here. My, uh, one of my sons is in the Sydney Business School um, and he did, he's just done Accounting 101. I would be, this is like a feedback loop here. I'd be lying to say that it blew his doors off. In fact, I think he found it a very difficult thing, but he's hanging in there. So, uh, uh, good on him, mate. Eh? All right. Um, earlier this year, I was reading a book by a guy called Stephen Johnson, and he, uh, he wrote a book called Where Do Good Ideas Come From, right? I was desperate at the time, obviously. And um, it was uh, making the point that cities and towns are actually the catalyst and the uh, hub for the beginnings of human development, right? That cities are incredibly important in terms of bringing people together and tapping into the collective uh, intelligence. And it really made me think about my responsibility in designing workplace, because in a workplace, you're bringing together three or 4,000 people who are highly educated, who are very motivated, are galvanized around values and purpose, and um, you have a massive responsibility. Because what's the human potential in bringing those people together? Now, I appreciate that probably all of you do not work in an office building. Can we have a quick round of applause? Uh, not round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to clap, clap. Yeah! I might have just walked out of camera there. Um, could I have a, just a show of hands? Um, or we did this thing the other day with uh, preschoolers where they put their finger on their nose. So let's put our finger on our nose if we work in an office. All right, there's a few of you here, so you're going to be with me on this. I would suspect that a lot of you would not wax lyrical about the experience of working in an office, all right? In fact, I would suspect that some people may even equate it to being buried alive <laughs> or some other terrible thing that's probably completely um, at odds with the Geneva Convention. And I have a real problem with that because I do work in an office myself. Who of us here really wants to admit that we work in an office? You know? I know if I mention it to my son, his first word is loser. <laughs> it's associated with working in an office. Loser. And um, I think, you know, in some ways, it's quite justifiable that, that opinion is held in our society. You know, you think about the comics that have been written about it, cartoons, disparaging TV shows that have been written about working in cubicles and offices. And despite all the good intentions of architects and designers and workplace technologists, many of the environments that we tend to work in are complete obstacles to productivity, both collectively and individually. They just don't work. And in fact, all they do is put barriers in the way of people doing what they do best. And that's communicating. So hence my talk today is about, and I get confused with the title because it's complicated, but turning it off to turn it on, okay? Or if you like, leaving it out to turn it on, okay? That's what I'm interested in. All right, we ran a conference like this similarly uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, we called it, it was in association, collaboration with WorkTech. I don't know whether anyone's been to a WorkTech conference. Similar kind of thing, right? Talking about technology. And the first half of the program was all about the future of technology, right? So we had a really big technologist there. I won't tell you who it is, but they were really big. And we had futurists, and they painted a picture for us of what the world would be like with technology. In the second half, it started with a reasonably young lady coming on the stage, taking off her skirt and standing on her head and talking about mindfulness and yoga. And then the conference progressed into somebody talking about language and the language we use together and the language of change. And in the banter at the end of that conference, what stood out to me was people were not talking about the future of technology. They didn't care. If anything, I think people were worried about it. And to that end, I'm, I'm with Anthony. There, it, there is scepticism around that. To my mind, 
People were actually interested in mindfulness. They were interested in what makes people people. They were interested in tapping into their intelligence, you know, in being creative, in being engaged with the people that sat around them. That, for me, was where the passion was out of that conference. Now, this is my first. You can see here that we have an incredibly sophisticated graphics design department <laughs> at Macquarie. Um, um, and this obviously took a while. It, there's no spelling mistakes, is there? Good. Okay. So when I talk about workplace and when we talk about workplace, what we talk about is we talk about the physical environment. But the physical environment's a statement of intent. It's a catalyst. It's an amplifier of behaviour. You talk about the virtual environment, but the virtual environment's just an enabler. It's an aggregator. It's an accelerator. It's a connector. It's an extension to what we do. It provides scale. But the key to the consideration, I'm glad you're taking a photo of that. I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> um, the key to the consideration is behaviour. It's about the behaviour. So ask yourself the question. When you came into this building today, and I'm going to be disruptive at the end of this because I'm going to talk about this room. I've got to think about this room. But when you came in today, were you inspired when you walked through that reception area with that anonymous artwork in it? When you sat in that, stood in that lift and you came up in the stainless steel, when you came out onto the lift lobby floor with its granite and carpet and fancy lights, did that light your fire? Did that turn you on? <laughs> you know, it's not about the desk. And it's not about the computer or the laptop or the telephone. It's about the behavioural environments that we wish to create for our people, right? And you know what? There is so many travesties to that that you can name. Look at any building in this city, or most of them. So, as a practitioner, I get to eat my own dog food a bit. And I'm definitely not a theorist or an academic. But um, one of the great things about being a practitioner is that you get to know your people, you get to learn, and you get to prototype, and then you get to test it. And so I'm going to show you a few prototypes we built. First one is Shelley Street. So we built this about 2009, and um, it was a disruptive building for us. We were asked by the business, do we need a desk? And you know what, it was a provocative question, right? Because everyone's talking about mobile technology, they were talking about you know, the world changing. And we said, it's a good question, but we don't know what the answer is, right? So it's interesting that you were saying that you went to um, Amsterdam. We also went to Amsterdam. I don't know what it is about the Dutch. Is anyone Dutch here or from the Netherlands? <laughs> what, a, what a place. It was actually, a, it was like, for me, it was a career-limiting move, potentially, to take people to Amsterdam, because it could have gone horribly wrong. But we took some senior executives over there, and we saw this place called Interpolis, and it did blow our doors off, right? The, it was like a, an epiphany that the business had, that suddenly you could think about space in a completely different way. And for us, that was the fire that was lit in that leadership team to really consider how it was that we designed that space. And as I say, we got rid of the desk. We said people don't need to sit at one desk all day. And we also got rid of 90% of the paper in that building as well. That number continues to go down. On the flip side, we did add lots and lots of technology because we were kind of really enamoured by the idea of mobility. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. The next building that we um, had a go at or prototyped was a building called Ropemaker. Well, it's in Ropemaker Street. It's not called Ropemaker. It's in Ropemaker Street, but it's in London. Um, what happened here was we were in love with another girl and someone came and took her from the altar and so we had to go with our bridesmaid, which wasn't a fantastic situation. But anyway, we got this building. And the first decision we made here was that we were going to blow the middle out of it. So if you think about works buildings like this, like what is it, right, that around these layered buildings that completely divide and compartmentalise people, you know? There's no sense of community in those buildings. People literally go in and out of them without even knowing who they work with. They're the most soulless, unfriendly places. And so what we were passionate there was to create a place that had community, 
that brought people together and that created a real sense of belonging to an organisation and to tapping into that, un that collective intelligence, to get people to have informal ad hoc conversations together. And we talked about this idea of bump factor. How much bump factor could we get in this building? How much could we get out of people bumping into each other as they walked through the building and had conversations with each other? It sounds so rudimentary, doesn't it? It sounds like such a basic idea, but it's something that was kind of revolutionary in a way. And it's certainly not the way base buildings are designed. Our uh, third prototype is a building that we've just built down here in Sydney in 50 Martin Place, 48 Martin Place. It's the old Commonwealth Bank building. You know, weirdly, with this building, it was actually the perfect building form for creating a community. And it was built in 1925. So it just shows you, doesn't it, that in some ways we've forgotten it. What happened was in that building, through the 80s, we kind of effectively stuffed it up. Um, by filling it up with things like plant rooms, air conditioning, full ceilings, lots of petitions. It was a rabbit warren, right? And our job here was to actually get rid of as much as we could possibly get rid of. So we effectively stripped it out. We opened up the atrium to be wider. We let natural light in because we know that's got a really positive effect on people's well-being. And we created a building that was connected visually, virtually um, and physically. A place where people knew where they were. It had a sense of place. And not only that, we really concentrated on creating a reason to bring people together. So our learning from Ropemaker was that we needed to proactively create community. It wasn't something that was going to happen just naturally. And so we decided that food was the glue. And we came up with this idea. We didn't. We actually borrowed an idea that Steve Jobs came up with. I don't know how he comes up with it. He's like Churchill. He seems to have a, a, an opinion on everything. Um, but um, we worked out that functional inconvenience was a great way to bring people together. So you just create enough tension in the building to make it so that people want to walk between floors. So we used the kitchens. We went from 36 kitchens down to four kitchens in the building to bring people together to create social space and we created a cafe in the middle of the building. We also started a gardening club. We have people who look after our chickens on a roster basis. The other day we found one of our head legal guys sitting in the chicken coop and he said that he just needed some time. <laughs> and then I was walking through the building and a lady accosted me yesterday and said, I cannot get onto the chicken feeding roster. It's so popular. Um, we've got edible food on the floor and we've also got um, the collective of the bees who are our inspiration obviously. We have 80,000 bees all working really hard on our roof to make 50 kilos of honey a year. Okay. Just quickly on technology because I know this is kind of a technology slant of conference. There's three things that I've learned about technology in these projects. One is you cannot beat a whiteboard if you want to have a good conversation. <laughs> Who believes in that? Yeah? Like, forget this sort of stuff. It's a waste of time, right? There's something incredibly compelling if I stand up here and I start walking, drawing on the wall. People love it. And we made a mistake. We put lots and lots of screens everywhere, and that's not what people want. They actually want walls that are painted with whiteboard paint because that's how we think and work together and solve problems and get people to understand complex ideas. Secondly, um, if it's hard, you won't use it, right? So technology that's complicated, people don't use it. I'll give you an example. This is a, an example that uh, we, we had the other day. So there's this guy sitting in Houston. He's the head of one of our businesses and he's talking to the boss, right? And he's on a video conference unit and the boss can't hear him. So he's saying, can you get closer to the microphone? And he kept going down and down, closer and closer to the microphone. Get closer, get closer, to the point where he's off camera. So you could just see his shoulder in the video conference, right? And he was down talking into the microphone. So it was a farcical situation. And I can guarantee you that he's not going to do it again, right? Because it's embarrassing. And the third thing is that you can only have a certain number of communication channels. And I think that one of the things is we're just layering more and more communication channels on people and you know what, they just don't want it. Because there's just only so much that you can deal with. So what's next? Well, we're working on this project now uh, called Number One Martin Place, linking seven floors. You can see our, we've got a, a stair that is Soferino in colour. There was a lot of debate about that. I think it's an awesome colour. 
And we just put the colour purely on the basis that it's Soferino. It's got a, such a great name. It's evocative, you know. <laughs> Sounds like a holiday. Um, but we've um, completely broken down the chicken runs. We've got an organic layout. We're bringing people together. And um, one of the things that I think is really important here is that we're really starting to think about the behaviours that we're trying to create. A couple of um, weeks ago, oh no, that's, that's actually an exaggeration, but could be for the purposes of making the point, but I won't. Um, in June, we uh, met these two guys, John and George Kemble. John, George Kemble was the co-founder of D School. He, got a, he really likes what we do with our space for some weird reason, and uh, we're collaborating now on space. And he's very much um, into, um, he calls them rhythms of agitation. We were in a call the other day and he actually designed his way out of the call. It was awesome. Instead of saying, I want to finish it now, he said, let's design our way out of this call, which is probably what you hope that I'm going to do right now, design my way out of this address to that way. Um, but anyway, we're talking about the types of environments that we're trying to create. How are we proactively going to create those environments? How are we going to create the environment in terms of the behaviours that we're looking for and do that proactively. And the second question that we're asking ourselves is, is, why do we have to finish it all? Why do we have to design it all? Why do we have to provide all the technology? Let's make it happen much more organically and let it evolve with the users of the building. Okay, I'm going to finish by being disruptive. Um, so this is it, right? <coughs> what is with this room? Like, is this the sort of room that we want for a conference? I'm stuck here because I've got to be in the camera. You're looking that way, right, when you're looking at the screens. So you're kind of looking at me, you're not looking at me. Um, is this the sort of behaviours that we want when we've got this conference, right? You're all sitting here passively, just looking at me, staring at me, freaking me out. <laughs> you know? So I think that that's, that's the point, right? That we've got to be disruptive about what we do. I think that we've got to think about what we do because, you know, a lot of the things we do are just dumb. Right? And there's always a good case to be self-disruptive. I'm borrowing your um, phrase there, Anthony. But there is always a case to be self-disruptive because you should never assume that what we're doing is the right thing. And I think that uh, there's obviously a design case just in this room right now to think about. So thank you very much.